Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you with me once again. This week is going to be a little different. Rather than chatting with a guest as I normally do, you get to have me on my own for a change. What I wanted to chat with you today was about the big story that I broke on August 2nd, court documents that showed us that Canada's uh, vaccine mandate for travel, the federal uh, vaccine mandate for travel, wasn't based on the science and the evidence as the Trudeau government claims, but on politics. For the last two weeks uh, on the show, I've been chatting with the key players in the case, the two applicants, Sean Rickard and Carl Harrison, and their attorney, Sam Presfalos. So here's what's been happening since I broke the story August 2nd. So first, the good news. The story has resonated widely with Canadians, and I'm truly gratified at all the support and encouragement that I've been receiving from many of you from all across the country, and I want to acknowledge that first and foremost. So thank you so much for reading and engaging with the story. Second, in a very unusual move, the Federal Court of Canada made it easier to access the documents, citing the high level of public interest in the case. And again, that's thanks to all of you for engaging with the story. The National Post for whom I write for um, wrote about the story, as did the Toronto Sun, Brian Lilly, and both credited yours truly for breaking the story. I also wrote a column for giving my own analysis uh, of the story for the British uh, newspaper, The Telegraph, uh, that it was essentially driven by politics, but Trudeau creating a potent election issue. This piece has also been widely shared and read. So there's a lot to be thankful for. But on the flip side, it's been it's striking that large sections of the Canadian mainstream media have just completely ignored it for something I believe has to be one of the biggest stories in recent years that speaks directly to the motivation of the Trudeau government. It's incredible, but perhaps not surprising that the usual suspects uh, simply aren't talking about it. This kind of deference uh, to official narrative is something that I've witnessed, experienced firsthand in the third world, but I naively thought that things were somehow different here in Canada. But thanks to individual Canadians like yourselves and independent voices like True North, the story is still alive. Now, talking about third world tin pot dictator territory, I was surprised and shocked uh, that two MPs, one liberal and the other NDP, viciously attacked me and the story without naming or tagging me on Twitter. These are not your garden variety anonymous trolls, but two elected representatives who are senior members of the current NDP liberal alliance that is presently governing Canada. One MP, Mark Gerritsen, tweeted saying my story was a big lie and that it was dangerous and needed to be confronted now. The other MP, Charlie Angus from the NDP, said that the story was written by a National Post columnist that gets money from the government and spreads conservative BS and propaganda. Now, just think for a moment what's going on here. Both of these MPs had an implied threat against my freedom of expression, both as an individual and as an independent journalist. Now, imagine for a second if a conservative MP had tweeted something similar, attacking, say, a Globe and Mail columnist or a CBC journalist. You'd never hear the end of it. They would have been called out immediately and other journalists would have spoken out. But when independent voices like me are attacked by two powerful MPs, The silence from the mainstream media is truly deafening. Now, I don't take such threats lightly. I've worked overseas and I've had politicians who didn't like my views trying to silence me. There were times where I genuinely feared for my safety. Maybe I was naive, but never in a million years did I think that this kind of bullying of independent voices and the chilling effect that it has on freedom of expression would follow me to Canada. But here it is. But here's the thing. This story is not about me, but about the court documents that are now in public view thanks to two courageous applicants and their lawyer. That's the story. Yet those attacking the story have made it made it about me, which conveniently deflects attention from the story itself. So I would tell you that if you share the story and they tell you, 
you can't trust her. She's lying because they saw one of these bogus attacks on me. Tell them it's not about her. Just take a look at the court documents and make up your own mind. And I also say that with MPs returning to Ottawa uh, and the fall session of Parliament set to begin in a few weeks, if you care about individual liberties and you don't want to see arbitrary mandates brought back in, please write to your MP and ask them to question the government and Parliament based on what this court case tells us, the documents that spell out in black and white exactly how the mandates came together. But I want to end on a positive note. I think enough Canadians are now waking up to the reality that governments aren't necessarily benign. And when they impose mandates that restrict our freedoms on the flimsiest grounds, we have a right to ask um, why and not simply defer to those in power just because they're in power and claim to know what's best for us. The good fight is worth fighting and I believe we're just beginning. On that note, thanks for joining me and I'll see you next week. Thank you.